Okay, so we're starting week five. We're supposed to work through test out module four, and that's over networking. So if you've done Cisco one or two, a lot of that stuff in there is just just a rehash of Cisco one and two. It should be easy for you to go through. They may show different ways of how to do variable link subnet masking and talk about CIDR or prefix notation. I think Cisco is now just calling it prefix instead of CIDR. Every time they come out with new curriculum, they use different. There's two different words there for representing the subnet mask and bit form. Um, so this week and uh, next week we go into storage, which we've already started working with some of the storage stuff, and then the week following that goes into Hyper-V. So we're going to be working with a lot of PowerShell over those modules. As Hyper-V, we've already messed with creating our virtual machines and stuff. And so you should be able to go through the test out and, and do that part. And so storage is what we left off on and we set up data deduplication on server 3. Of course we have to view it graphically through server 1. So let's see what, what happened over the weekend. It did, would not deduplicate unless the data was at least three days old. So I've logged into server one. Uh, I'm on file and storage services in server manager. And I'm highlighted on volumes. And now what I've done, I've scrolled down to view server three and eDrive. And right now it's still showing me the same stuff it showed on the last class period, but it hasn't refreshed. I want to refresh my screen and see I should have some type of data deduplication if everything worked correctly. If not, it would still show zero. So it says I've got a 50% deduplication rate. So I've saved 1.02 gig of storage. I thought I only had about a gig on that drive. Well that's interesting. Did I map a network drive? No. I think that's the other class. So it's showing a total capacity of 58.9 gig and free space now at 57.9 gig. Before it was like right at 57.0 or 56.9 gig or so free when I dumped all those uh, large files onto our share. You should have come up with something similar on your screen. Let me do that. Look at some of yours here. Let's see, Dakota. I'm going to bring yours up on the screen. So you have an 87%. You went kind of crazy making big files, though. I think uh, free space when I got done, I only had like 51 point something gigs. Yeah, so you saved 6.81. I'm noticing it's at the 57.9. So there's probably some overhead with indexing and database sizing and stuff or data deduplication because you've got the exact same free space I have and we have different uh, size files and stuff so they probably got a got a database when they deduplicated and it's taking up a certain amount of capacity it seems like no matter what so you had a much better percentage I think as you put more and more files on there that percentage could go up as long as the files are similar to each other Files that don't data deduplicate much would be compressed audio files like MP3 format files, um, encrypted files, and audio files. Those are already normally almost max compressed. If you already have zip files, unless you have several of the exact same zip file, it wouldn't be able to deduplicate those. And you're probably looking at about a 20 to 50% normal deduplication rate. 
Oh yeah, Chris, you've got the same 557.9. So that that's got to be a an auto database out there. It's taking up some space. So that's pretty good. You got 55%. That's why I wanted at least a gig or more file on there to have something to chunk and work on and show some space. He said, I've got one file server. It's got a uh, 2 point something, 2.4 terabyte volume. And I've data duplicated about 400 gig of stuff. It's got file shares and every every instructor and, and administrative assistant has home folders. And they put files and stuff out there. We get emails over like instructions on how to do something that will save the same file. To, or I have the same file in all their home folders. So a lot of stuff is copied in multiple locations. So that's quite a bit of savings we've got on that one server system. And as I was talking, the the entire data in the world stored on hard drives it doubles every two years. So all data created since the first hard drive in the 1950s up till now, they will create all of that amount of data They'll be able to double it in two years. It's insane. Last time there was, I think, 400 hours of video being uploaded to YouTube every minute. Something like that. But that's been a little while back. So every minute there's 400 extra hours being, being accumulated onto the YouTube cloud. You have thousands of people uploading videos all the time. I don't know. They're they're already getting to the point right now that the amount of data in the world is getting the number of bits stored numbers about the number of grains of sand in Earth. I don't know how we ever calculated the amount of sand and that's on the planet, but some scientists estimated you know the the grains of sand on Earth and the number of bits that we have created is equaling or going to surpass the grains of sand on Earth. We've either already surpassed it or it'll be surpassed within the next year or two. We're bumping up on that point. So big data is huge. That's why data deduplication is really big. Um, and they're doing things with backups. Data deduplication is really great with backups. It's looking at, you know, making sure that we're only backing up changed data, changed blocks, instead of trying to back up make full backups of systems every day is like okay if something hasn't changed in four or five years we don't need 50 copies of it sitting out somewhere we just need one copy of it so that's really really big okay so the, what we move on into now is looking at I guess PowerShell So I told you to write scripts, which is your main function as a network administrator. You're going to write a script and you're probably going to have it scheduled to run maybe daily, a weekly script, or maybe even something that runs once a month. Uh, I think we have some scripts here on campus that runs every two to four hours because our campus management system the, it exports user files, I believe every two hours. Those people get accepted into the university, that group of students, you know, that file will be updated. So I believe we have scripts to run about every two or four hours. They grab those new updated files if anything has changed and run through them to check for stuff. So I said on Server Manager, you have Windows PowerShell ISE. You also have Windows PowerShell ISE on a Windows 10 machine. You won't have some of the same commandlets in it though because you won't have Active Directory and, and other stuff installed, but you could research how to install extra modules in the PowerShell. But if you aren't joined to a domain, they wouldn't really do anything if you added them in there. There's PowerShell ISC, the modules have to operate on some type of live computer. So when you launch that PowerShell, It comes up and looks like this. You watch the, the 86 
I mean, hardly ever use 86 unless you're actually working on a 32-bit system. You would never really want to launch the x86 one. Almost all systems now, all servers now are pretty are 64-bit. So you want to watch launch ISE 6 uh, without the x86 on the end because if you're running any Microsoft server product, it's going to be running the 64-bit. If you're trying to do something on some Windows 10 32-bit machines, which there are still 32-bit Windows 10 out there. I've not seen any of them, but one of our instructors has a 32-bit version of Windows 10 at home. Um, that'd be the only reason you'd want to want to write something in 32-bit code. So I just launched the ISE without anything at the end. So this script, you have to hit the down arrow so you have an area to write scripting in. So let's review. I didn't make a video last time when we did PowerShell. I want to make sure that this here is all recorded in the video. Let's review variables. A variable is defined with a dollar sign followed by letters. Of course, if the dollar sign is anywhere in this list, and these are already pre variables in RAM. Some of the stuff is information about the computer system you're you're running on, the user account and stuff that you're running. So you can't use something that's already out there. You've got to create something new. Um, example. I know this example is not in the list, so that's a variable that I can create. There's not a already a pre operating system. And we can put something inside of it. I literally just put something is in this variable. I surround it in double quotation marks. If you're doing text, most all coding languages require text to be surrounded in single quotes or double quotes so it knows that it is ASCII text and not, not a command. And there's a couple ways to display example. I showed y'all before is using a commandlet. All commandlets have a, a verb like write is a verb, it's, it's doing something, writing, followed by a dash and a noun, host being the computer screen, so we're going to write to the host, meaning it's going to display information to the computer screen. I can put out their examples. So if I hit the green play button, we'll store information, the, a variable called example, and then we'll run a commandlet to write that out to the host. So we see down here in the blue part, it says something is in our variable. That's the write host command being executed and displaying that. PowerShell is pretty forgiving. You can also just write the variable name. And it will display the contents the same way that write host displays the contents. It may be a little bit harder to, to see. The reason people don't do this, I mean, but, but PowerShell can do it. It might be a little bit confusing for somebody writing code or somebody new looking at your, your code here. What is dollar sign example doing? If they're not familiar with PowerShell, if you see write host dollar sign example, you know that it's writing something to the screen. Uh, I can copy and I can paste that. I'll use my control V code combination on the keyboard. You can see anytime I put example, you know, put stuff to the screen. It's called a variable because at any point in time I can make it equal to something else. When I play this here, you can see it prints out something's in this variable. We're looking at this part down here, the output. 
that I've just highlighted. So something's in this variable and then we made an update to it. Yeah, we said it's equal to something else. Different words are here and then it prints out different words are here. So the variable can accept information at any point in time and, and output that information. And can be changed at any point in time. The trick we showed last time to make things look a little bit better on the screen is to use the clear host command or clear. Clear by itself is is normally what you can run. It's aliased, equaling the clear host, but it's best if you write out full clear host. And we'll hit play there. You'll probably see most coders though, they'll just use the word clear especially if they're used to Unix or Linux because there's a clear command there's not a they don't have the the verb noun combos in Unix and Linux cool huh so that's variables And really key, and any any coding language normally has a variable. Most coding languages, you have to declare it. You have to type in a keyword like var space and a variable name to declare it. Um, I wouldn't really write that down as notes, but just just note that other coding languages, there's normally some way. Sometimes you have to put the the character type and size. You have to specify like, you know, is this going to be ASCII, is it going to be numeric, or an integer, a floating where it has a decimal place in it. And the define just like how big it is. So different coding languages have different ways to define variables. I like PowerShell. Most of the time we don't have to declare what's going to be in there. I'm going to create another one up here called example 2. I'm not going to surround it in quotation marks because 1, 2, 3, 4 is an integer. It's numeric. It's not text. I'm just randomly just just printing out stuff here. Um, I did something. I did something different. So I have variables up here. One has one, two, three, four in it. Another one I put four, five, six, seven in it. And this one has text because it's got quotes in it. So I just print it out you know, just like we've been doing, printing the, the values of each one of these out on the screen. Then here on line 22, I did something different. What did I do? I put example three plus example two. And I, it printed out 5,801. So it added. 1,234 to 4,567 together when you come up to 5,801. I can do other stuff like multiply with an asterisk. Should also be able to divide. I'm using my Control C and Control V keys. If you're wondering what I'm, how I'm getting that up there so quick, copy and paste. So 
to play that again. We still got the you see the you see down here to 5801 when I multiply them together. I get 5,635,678. When I divide them, I come up with a 3.7 number. Float point number. Floating. What happens if I try to add example 3 to example 1? There's not an example one. It's just example. Sorry. It found out there was an example one, so it just printed out the value of example three, which had the four, five, six, seven in it. I got an error. Most students just see red and they stop there. It's like it's broke. What? Do I, how do I fix it? Like, well, what's the error say? I uh, cannot convert uh, different words are here to an INT32. Like, well, it's saying it can't convert letters into numbers. That's exactly what it's saying. So you've got a problem. You're doing something wrong here. It's not possible to be done. Yeah, you, you can't add numbers and letters together. They didn't tell the algebra people. Yeah. You're in first, second grade. You can't add 4 to the letter M. <laughs> you didn't do that. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> now, if it was hex and you're adding 4 to like the letter A, B, C, D, E, or F, yeah, you might be able to do something like that. If, if you're like, this is all hex digits, and then you got to figure out what 4 is in hex and what, what the letter is in hex and binary atom and then convert it over. But no, we're not doing anything that silly. So don't go off out into that tangent. I know there's hex and there it goes to the letter F on hex, but but you'd also have like it'd be designated that this is a hex digit with like zero x in front of the, the hex decimal value. That's why you see zero x and you see some that a lot of times looking through the computer system. Those are hexadecimal values. Not decimal. They may cover some of that in chapter 4. I don't know if they cover hex in 4 or not. The MAC address is written in hex. So we just did a lot of play right there and, and showed you can't add, add stuff together. What if I change sample 3 into I'm going to get a lot of errors down here anywhere I'm trying to add, multiply, or divide. So I got lots of lots of errors, but I got something else. So, so where what just happened? So where'd go here? Let's see if I can if I can match the the number of the letters. So words go here, there's a uh, sample three, and then we had a second words go here, and then a third words go here, and then we had words go here and it printed out one, two, three, four. Well, that's interesting. We didn't throw an error there. It just added them together. Uh, it was able to convert one, two, and three into a numeric. I mean, into out, um, ASCII instead of numbers. So that's interesting. Then we multiplied it. I guess we we printed out words go here 1,234 times. Well, that's interesting. I was thinking we'd get some errors. And then we try to divide it. And it's like, yeah, we can't divide letters into other letters or even into integers. And then we added it here. Words go here. Different words go here or are clumped together. 
So you're going to have some kind of weird oddities there. That's why a lot of coding languages you define exactly what's inside the variable. Microsoft tried to auto, they auto changed the 1, 2, 3, 4 into ASCII character alphanumeric instead of only only numbers and were able to do stuff with it. I think it also may depend on which one's first. It come across example three first and seen it was text and then it seen example two was numbers and it's like that doesn't work and it auto try to convert. If we reverse those, I bet I bet they would fail because it would see numbers first. And then it would see ASCII and then they're like, I can't convert number to ASCII, but they can get Yep, they make a different so depending on your order, it's kind of flaky on that. That's why most coding languages are more strict on their their variables. You define it as an integer or a float or a string, and it never changes throughout. And that way you can't run into this issue with which way, which side of the operator did you put the variable on? How does it determine what's what? So yeah, it's pretty open, but you can run into some flakiness there if, if you're not careful. It's so forgiving you can make mistakes. We will run into some issues later on when we're creating user accounts and we're trying to pass a password into it. And the password has to be pre-encrypted. We can't pass just a plain text string into a command line. So we'll find a PowerShell command that where we have to actually use some PowerShell code to encrypt a text string into a Microsoft encrypted password, store that into a variable, and then pass it into the command to create their account with the password. So we'll have to do some conversion there. You can't just take plain text. So I'm going to go ahead and clear all of this off. I guess I'll leave the clear host up there. Let's look. Last last time we used a commandlet called get. Really common to pull information out of a computer system. Get 80 user. Get Active Directory user. If you just run it like that, it asks for a filter. So I I've already done this. I know that I have to type filter asterisk meaning show me everything. I could read up on how to create a filter. I would have to Google that, see if I need brackets, quotation marks, what, what could I filter. I'd have to look at examples to figure that out. So, But I want to grab everything. If I play, it'll display all the users to the screen. It displays a small subset of information about a user. It only grabs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten items on each user. A lot of these users are built in and disabled, like the guest account, the administrator account. Let's put out there dash properties. This is something I've Googled and looked up in the past. Dash properties, and I'm going to put an asterisk. And I'm going to hit the play button. The information gathered on a user account is now much more extensive. You also see the security ID that's behind the user or the account. And 
Let me see if I can find administrator in this ginormous list. So here's the administrator account. Do you see the security ID? On my screen up here? It's probably hard for you to scroll and find, but you see the, uh, I want to tell you something about security. It's way back in the 90s and stuff. It was uh, a security practice to change the administrator account name to something else. You'd rename the administrator to like Bob Dole and then you'd create a regular user called administrator to try to trick hackers. So they break into the, the administrator account that was a regular user and they didn't know that the actual admin account that this this field right here was just simply renamed to like Bob Dole. He ran for president way back in the day. Talking third person. It's kinda weird when he campaigned. The hackers quickly learned that every single administrator account the security ID ended in 500 so all they had to do was scan for 500 at the end of SID and knew that that was the administrator account and they did display that to the, to the <coughs> screen so all the tools now you know, they, they figured that about like 96, 97, 98 sometimes hackers figured that out so every admin account ends in 500 just pointing that out since we were we were here at this point um, doesn't really go with this class, just kind of goes with, you know, I've been, been in IT for a long time and what they used to, used to think was secure. And I still think of the Wizard of Oz and, you know, the, the professor being behind the curtain. He used to go look like, he's right here, we see him. This little dog found him over here. It didn't take anybody, it didn't even take a human to figure that out. <laughs> so that's, that's a lot of security seems like. Okay, so there's a lot of a lot of stuff. Um, I see a field here called company. Everybody see that? Everybody see that it's blank. Company is blank. I can go into Active Directory Users and Computers. I can find the built in administrator account. And I can see the company is blank right there. Right? I can look at guest. And the company is blank. I can look at these other like default accounts. The company's blank. How many users? We have one, two, three users. Do we have users anywhere else? No, it looks like three users is all we got. Only one's active, of course, right now. Okay, I want to set Contoso as the company for all three users. Now I could, there's only three, it'd be real quick for me to do it without PowerShell. Can I do that? Yeah, I could, I could do that really quick without PowerShell, but if you had a place where there's thousands of users and stuff, and they're scattered in different folders all over the place, PowerShell becomes an easier route to do it. Yeah, so, it so yeah, let's, we're going to do, we're going to do this PowerShell command that, and change company. But for right now, I'm going to store all of this information into a variable called users. Maybe I'll just make it employees. It's whatever you want to name it. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to name something, you know, Sane. Please don't use curse words and different um, obscene stuff. Other people might see your work. Don't do that. 
And last, last week we talked about a for loop. And the computer has to operate on, on things one at a time. So right here, we just stored all the user accounts and all the properties of those user accounts into employees. So now we got to get employees and there's three of them in there at least. Then we got to act on each one individually. That's where I said the power of for each comes into play. For each opens with uh, opening closing parentheses, an opening curly bracket, and a closing curly bracket. So that's the structure of a for each loop. Inside the parentheses, you have a variable that, uh, hold on, let me take this call. Okay, so I'm back. So yeah, so the for each, you've got inside the parentheses, you create a variable for the individual objects, and then you supply the variable that has the multiple objects. And you put the keyword in, in between it. So it reads like a sentence, for each, and I'm gonna put employee notice I put employee not employees if that's too confusing a lot of people use the variable called item something singular so you know that that's an individual and they use the keyword in and they put the variable that has multiple things in it like employees so if you think putting employee would trip you up you might just put like item or thing or, or something so for each item in employees we'll do something with it inside the curly brackets you'll only reference the item variable you won't reference employees employees has everything inside of it and you can't deal with a huge chunk of data you have to say take this first first user account out of an employees do something with it loop back through get the second one and deal with it loop back through get the uh, the last one and do something with it so that's how the item works it it temporarily holds it it's a true variable every time it loops it fills it with new information it fills it with the next account so that makes it really a true variable I'm going to print to the screen the item dot I think it's Sam count name and then space dollar sign item dot company Yeah, this code right here is what's being looped. Okay. So when it comes through, we get everything under employees. All the user accounts. Could be one, could be a million. It's stored into there. You need a lot of RAM if you had a million accounts. Uh, so if you're working at Walmart or something like that, you need to, need to be careful with some of your scripts. You'd probably need to actually filter or do a search base and limit it to organizational units instead of the entire domain there's ways to do that you, you can limit down to to individual folders in active directory but well, we're not getting into that yet 
So we come down to here, it uh, takes that, takes the first employee, puts it into item. So item only holds one user account. And then this right here writes that information. It writes the SAM account name, which is the login name. That's what Microsoft calls the login name in Windows. When we did this properties, and I look, the only way to know SAM account name is, is to just look at this command by itself without putting in a variable and looking at all those column headings and figuring out what's what. And there's probably a hundred of them for each user. There's a lot to go through. Um, but I'm just writing out the user account name. It looks like there's four users. I've only seen three. I don't know where this where this user is at. I didn't see him in Active Directory. He must be in there somewhere. Maybe a hidden account. I don't know. So we found more accounts than we could find graphically. That's something you can do. Uh, so we just print it out to see what, if we got the right stuff to the screen. We're wanting to set the company, though. So, we can use the set command. Set eighty user. I think we can. I think I need to look up help on set eighty user. So. We'll Google set. 80 user <coughs> so set 80 user has all of these switches notice they have dash company right here in string string means text if there's a space in it we'd have to have quotation marks around it but string means we put dash company and, and we write letters. We're going to use Contoso. We're going to put dash company space Contoso, probably for trying it in quotation marks so we know that it's a string. But I've got to identify what 80 user that I'm going to apply the word Contoso to. So I'm going to scroll down and look at some of their their examples. They're using something called identity that looks like a SAM account name. And they're using identity again. An identity. I don't see them using SAM account as the way to identify the person. There's identity followed by the Active Directory user. So it looks like, but it looks like the identity is the same thing. So I'm going to delete that and I'm going to print out item dot dot identity and see if that works. Nope, it doesn't print out identity. Identity must be a, a switch with only the set command. And it looks like it's the same value as the same account name. I'm going to use set AD user 
dash identity and instead of trying to type a administrator or guest or default account here I'm going to use this value because it printed the login name to the screen when I use this and that's really the only reason I did write host is to see if I got on the screen what I needed to use you normally don't write a lot of stuff to your screen running scripts you just want it to do stuff in the background but these write hosts are good for when you're writing these scripts figure out you know am I getting the right stuff like I think I should get this am I really getting that it's the only time I really write stuff to the screen so I use this as a, a help or a crutch or whatever to see is, is that the right stuff I need to use so I'm going to set 80 user dash identity provide it the SAM account name dash company and I'm going to put Contoso in quotation marks I'm going to copy this line 6 and I'm going to paste it underneath so it should write out administrator it should write out blank and then it's going to set the administrator account company field to Contoso and then it'll print it out again before it loops back and gets the next one so I should have administrator with a blank and then it should follow with administrator and Contoso no it won't It won't do that because I stored all the information up here. It's blank up here. It, it won't. This is still blank. I don't fetch any information again. So never mind. It won't do that. It won't do that. So no point in trying. So I'll delete that line. I had to think a little bit. I didn't go out and retrieve the the set field. There'd be no way to, to view that. Okay, let's if you got this all typed out and you hit play, I we'll hope we don't get any red. So I hit play, it went through, it printed out each user, and then set the value to contesta.com. I can go look at the account in Active Directory and see that it worked. It's set. What about for the guest account? It's set. I could go back in here and and what I could do, I could cut this set out because I don't need to execute it again. That'd be just be a waste of processing power. I could cut this line and simply play this whole script again. They're already set, so it's going to retrieve all the information and then print it out to the screen. So I should have Contoso print it out beside each user. So not pretty neat. pretty pretty cool I think we should just get into some really deep engineering right now yep I think so so I'm just gonna get rid of that line for now so we'll go into some major engineering I'm get some white space in here so we can have some space to do stuff. I'm going to put in an if statement. If. I'm going to open up a curly bracket. So I'm going to get rid of that white space there. 
I'm going to go down here on the after the set A to user and close the curly bracket. I'm going to use the word else. I'm going to open a curly bracket and close a curly bracket. And this is where it gets a little complicated. But they have these little collapsing things here that you can see that you've got the curly bracket set. So else you can see what code, if there was code in between there, it would disappear or reappear. So you can see what was part of that bracket, this if statement, the whole thing, or the top part. So what code disappears, which would be this line 8 here, would be in the top bracket. So an if statement, that's a logic statement. If true, if what's in the parentheses is true, you're going to execute the stuff in the first curly bracket. If whatever you put in the parentheses comes out to be false, it would execute the stuff down here in the bottom part. If I have $20, buy gas. Else, stay home. You know, that kind of logic. We got to put the logic right in here. If, if what? If dollar sign item dot company. The equal than, less than, greater than, and stuff are not the actual symbols. They are abbreviated codes. I think that'll work. If the item dot company is equal to the text Contoso, I'll cut that and put that down here. If it's equal to Contoso, then we want to write host. This is what we want to do if it's true. So if the company is already set to Contoso, is basically what we're stating. We want to write out to the screen um, user account item dot sam account name space That doesn't need to be a capital A. So for each user, it's looking only at the company field. If it's already set to Contoso, if that's true, it's going to write out to the screen a sentence that reads user account. It's going to print the username. And it's going to write already set, period, to the screen. Otherwise, it'll run this command. And just to be sure that we're not actually getting to that command, we should we should probably do a write host here just to test our script out to make sure nothing's wrong with with our logic and go user account had to be set. So if we see that text then we know that that something's went wrong because we already we've already played the script and set all the user accounts. So if we get any output like that, user account had to be set, we know we've got something wrong in our our logic. It's really really easy to be off on your logic. 
So I'm going to run this script and see what happens. So if I play it this time, user account administrator already set. User account guest already set. Default account already set and KRB TGT already set. So we didn't get any user account had to be set on the screen, so that's good. What language is PowerShell programming? PowerShell. That is the language. Um, I'm going to do a thing. Y'all don't do it yet. created a user and I'm going to hit play. I should have a user that has to be set because I just created a new one just to show as example up here. So when I hit play it says user account had to be set. It would probably been useful if I added like the SAM account or something so I know what user was, was set. But, but this time it I did have a user account, a brand new account, did not have company set in their field. So this script is working properly. It goes and gets every user account, checks if the company field is set or not. If it's not set, we get down here to the else and we fix it. We do a lot of that on campus here. They scan user accounts continuously and compare them to the campus management system to make sure everything is, is set properly. Yeah, do you use tabs? Sometimes it tabs out to kind of see. There's a lot of different ways to. Okay, I have coding classes, so I just got used to spacing everything out, making them look neat. Some code, like Python, you have to use tabs. They don't use brackets. And that's really cool. Python doesn't use brackets. It just uses tabs to figure out where the if statement begins and else statement and stuff like that begins and ends. So let me look at your screen. PowerShell uses curly brackets though. Yeah. Yeah, so trying to figure out these two curly brackets what he did. He tabbed everything over that belonged to the if and actually if you really wanted it strict coded out it looked more similar to that. So there's different ways to add tabs and white spaces and, and invention to see that and this right here is the four. You can see it real easy. You can see four started and you see nothing until at this point. There's where it ended. This if statement, you can see it started on that line. And you can see that there's an else in the mix. And there's another curly bracket. So you can see there's multiple parts to the if statement because right along this line there's you see the closing brackets. So that sometimes helps track where curly brackets open and close. You can get really lost when you get long lines and stuff and where 
and miss a closing bracket somewhere. Those are fun trying to troubleshoot and get really complex. Scripts normally aren't too bad to get. Well, yeah, you can get complex scripts too. But But this is the big power of PowerShell. Getting information out of out of a system, putting it into a variable, throwing it into a loop so you can get one piece at a time and check it. So we got into some real advanced logic here. We did loops, sniff statements. That's what most coding is <coughs> or scripting testing something you either have a pass or fail and based on that pass or fail meaning true or false you act upon it and it takes a while to get your mind wrapped into a if then else type in loops this takes lots of, lots of different practice and normally it's a lot easier if you have a client that's got an issue like I need this done here's a problem can you script this out for me so they lay out the problem for you write it out and you can then you have to figure out what coding behind that would, would help solve that issue so just sitting down and going I want to write a script yeah it's kinda your brain's like I don't want to write a script I don't have a problem let's go play let's go fishing do something else I normally have to be given a problem like here solve this with a script so what do you think does it look kind of cool or way too hard I've been learning scripts too, but if I gave you a problem to, to solve I'm sure you just like uh, how do I take what you just showed us and and solve a problem so yeah it's, we'll have a lot more practice and stuff and towards the end I've got some assignments like three different PowerShell assignments that are given to solve problems and then if, I think we got a final presentation had somebody go through and do a bunch of uh, logic and create a game they took in user inputs and stuff they created a Dungeons and Dragons game yeah as the, they did really good on on their Dungeons and Dragons game that they did. You'd, you'd go into different rooms and depending on which way you turn left, right, up north or whatever, answering questions and attacking a monster, different like Are forms of attacking it. And, hmm? Is it graphical too? No. Oh, okay. No, it was all all command the original original mud dungeon and dragon yeah. type where you like tell it in somewhere and Yeah, whole game is text based. Your, your original text based Dungeons and Dragons. They were into that, and so they coded the game. I'm like, that's. You did really well. Like, if you can do that logic, then you could do the same logic and navigate Active Directory and solve stuff easily. I think, uh, do you know Trey Kirk? 